We'll just give it a minute to get everybody in and then we'll kick off. <laughs> We'll just give it a minute to get everybody in. Right, I think it's time, so we'll we'll start off. A very good evening, uh, ladies and gents, and welcome to the eighth episode of the British Ship Society Midweek Special. I'm Vikas Kanduja, consultant orthopedic surgeon in Cambridge and chair of the Education Committee in the BHS. And it's certainly a pleasure to welcome all of you to this webinar. Now, our aim with the series, as you're well aware, is to bring to you clinical cases and discuss intricacies of decision making and management from key opinion leaders in the UK so that we can continue to fulfill our society's manifesto of sharing knowledge and improving patient care. We've already had three excellent sessions on the young adult hip, and the session today would be focused on extra articular hip pathology. Now, moderating this session today would be Mr. Tony Andrade, past president of International Society for Hip Arthroscopy from Reading. And we also have a stellar faculty joining us uh, from different parts in the UK. We've got uh, Professor Ernest Childers from London and Leeds, Professor Max Feely from Manchester, and Mr. Andy Langdown from Portsmouth. And I'll let Tony introduce them to you in a minute. We're also delighted to be collaborating with Author TV Global for the series and welcome all the viewers from the Asia Pacific region who are able to watch this event streaming live via AuthorTV Global at no cost. We strive to make every session as interactive as possible. So please do post in your comments and questions in the Q&A box. Our panelists will address some of these as we go along on the Q&A box itself and choose some of them to discuss live at the end of the webinar. Now, for those of you who are not able to join us live, we do have the option of on-demand viewing on our educational platform, Benopto, so please do log in via the BHS website and you can watch it there. Once again, a very warm welcome to all of you and hopefully you'll enjoy this evening and also the series. Over to you, Tony. Thank you, Vikas, and uh, welcome everybody to what's going to be a very exciting session tonight. Um, we're talking about uh, young adult hip problems, and we've got, uh, as Vikas has already mentioned, a bit of a stellar faculty. We've got three professors tonight, so I feel a little bit underqualified to be moderating this in front of the three professors, but we'll give it a go. Uh, so first off, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Max Feely from Manchester, um, who's an extremely experienced hip arthroscopist and hip surgeon, and he's going to be talking to us about problems with psoas, so psoas pathology and treatments. So, Max, welcome, and please share with us your experience in this topic. Thank you, Max. Thank you very much, Tony, and uh, welcome to everyone to a, a rainy and very dark Manchester, which is obviously very unusual. Uh, so, if you bear with me, we'll just get this started. So, uh, so, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Dick Ass and Tony, for asking me to do this. Um, and the original brief was iliopsoas plus deep gluteal pain. But iliopsoas itself is quite a big topic. So I'm going to try and just focus on that. And then if we have time later, we can then start to look into deep gluteal pain. So anyone who does arthroscopy will have come across psoas problems. And they can be really quite difficult to deal with, uh, particularly in a certain subset of patients, which I'll come to later. But just to remind ourselves of what the psoas is and why it's important. So it's the main hip flexor uh, emanating in a combined origin from uh, the spine, the lower lumbar spine, so T12 to L3. And then as it goes into the pelvis, it combines with the iliacus and then joins together to form a common tendon, uh, slips underneath the inguinal ligament and then attaches to the lesser trochanter. So it does a combination of hip flexion and external rotation. And it's probably, it is by far the most important hip flexor of all of them. What isn't quite so commonly understood is its other function, which is as a hip stabilizer. And in a lot of ways, this is the cause of all its problems. So when you have a normal hip that doesn't hurt you, it just works as a normal hip flexor. Uh, 
But once the hit becomes painful, uh, it starts to overwork to try and counteract it. So when you have a sore hip, you tend to stand with your hip flexed and your spine curved. And so the psoas counteracts that by trying to keep you straight. And that's why so many patients with hip pathology start to get pathology within their iliopsoas tendon and their, their muscle group. And we'll, we'll come to that a little bit later. So I'm going to base this around a case, uh, which is what we were asked to do. And I picked a slightly atypical one. So this is a 17-year-old male footballer who originally was seeing a, a sports and exercise medicine doctor, uh, who I deal with a lot. It's very common for us arthroscopists. And essentially, he had a one-year history of right groin pain and then developed clunking towards the front of his joint a little bit later on. Um, so when he was previously seen, he had a negative FADIR test, so that's flexion, adduction, and internal rotation, and a really obvious and audible psoas clunk. So that's a clunk at the front of the hip joint. When you go from flexed and external rotated to bringing down the leg so that it's lying flat on the bed, uh, and that's called the McCarthy extension test. And it's a really good test for psoas pathology. So essentially, I examined him, and he was actually a bit sore within the hip itself. Um, but this really obvious clunking psoas, which was mildly tender, but very audible. So to get the ball started, we started with an MRI scan. And we're very lucky to have a 3T scanner, which gives us really good quality images. Um, and essentially, he had really good articular cartridge surfaces, which is important for me because I see a lot of people with early joint damage. No gross labral tear. And on imaging, his psoas tendon looked okay, because quite often it could be quite inflamed in itself or there may be evidence of bursitis around the tendon. We do a lot of hip arthroscopy as well as uh, robotic hip replacements. And so we arranged for him to have a CT because what we really wanted to see was the morphology of the joint. In other words, the shape of the femoral head and the acetabulum. Uh, and we use a lot of 3D reconstructions to do that. And again, he had good preservation. His acetabulum was a normal shape, so it wasn't dysplastic or retroverted, but he did have a really obvious cam deformity, which almost certainly was the initial cause of the symptoms. But at this point, it still wasn't quite, quite clear where his pain was coming from. So was it from the joint itself or was it a secondary pain from the psoas? And if he has two areas of pain, which is the main underlying issue and which is the secondary one? Because normally in these patients, the, the painful hip joint is the main issue and the, the secondary psoas pain is, is secondary to that. And there's no point treating psoas in isolation. So to try and separate these out, we arranged for him to have an ultrasound, or an X-ray guided um, hip inject joint injection, and we tend to use a combination of corticosteroid and ostinal or hyaluronic acid, and we and that was to see how much pain was his hip and how much wasn't, and some of it did go away, although it didn't affect the clunking, and then we did an ultrasound guided steroid injection up the psoas sheath, and that's really useful to try and pin down how much of the pain is from the psoas and how much isn't. And for some patients, particularly flexible females, it can sometimes just settle it down completely. So it can be both diagnostic and therapeutic. But I think doing these injections on their own never really helps longer term because often there's muscle imbalance around the hip joints and particularly in, in flexible hypermobile females. So we would always combine that with really good targeted physiotherapy, particularly looking at core and hip girdle muscle strength. Because what you're trying, because essentially in these patients, your hip flexor is out of balance, it's overworking and then becomes painful. And often the glutes are misfiring. They've often got a bit of sacroiliac pain or low back pain and may well start to get some glute pain. So therapy is really useful to deal with all those outside muscle issues. Uh, but obviously don't change the underlying hip discomfort or groin pain. But we would always try that combination. And unfortunately for him, his, while his groin pain improved with the hip injection and the strengthening, he still had this clunking, uncomfortable hip flexor. And that was because it had been present for so long, it had physically become bigger, more inflamed. Uh, and so it now became a mechanical problem rather than just a pain problem. So after much discussion, we then decided to go ahead with hip arthroscopy. And the aim of that was to have a good look inside the joint, make sure there's no un other underlying issues which weren't shown up on the MRI scan, deal with any bony abnormalities that may have then triggered the psoas problem in the first place, 
And in his case, he had a, a mild pincer, but did have a significant cam, which we then resected. And while we were there, we then did a psoas relief. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit how I did that in a second. So if you remember that photograph or the, the diagram I showed you of the anatomy of the psoas, so it comes from the spine and the iliacus, combines and then moves over the joint uh, and down to the left trochanter. So if you're going to think about doing an endoscopic release, essentially there's three main areas to do that. So from within the central compartment or the joint itself, from within the peripheral compartment or the outer aspect of the joint, and then finally from the lesser trochanter. And there's pros and cons of each of those, and I'll just talk you through that now. So the most common point is, or traditionally was from the central compartment. And this is a video from one of our colleagues, Ben Lund, uh, from Denmark, who's a very experienced arthroscopist. And essentially, you, you access the, the psoas from around the 12 or probably more one o'clock, half past one position uh, around the acetabulum. You go through the capsule to get to it. Uh, and then it's, it's actually quite a nice way of doing that. And that's, it's very easy to visualize. But obviously, and you can see this quite easily from this video, you have to go right through the front of the capsule to get there. Um, and so by definition, almost, you go through those anterior capsular ligaments. And if you've already got a patient who has joint laxity or hypermobility, that will inevitably make them more unstable. So quite a few people have now moved away from doing that to accessing it through the peripheral compartment. And you do that by going to the junction of the zona bicularis and that medial synovial fold and just burning your way through or buzzing your way through that capsular tissue and doing a release until you get to muscular fibres. So essentially, you're removing the, the tendinous part, but you do leave muscular fibres in place. Um, so they get the benefit of the release, but may still get a little bit of tiny flicking, but it doesn't leave them as potentially weak as, as the third method can do, uh, which I'll come to now. So the third method is to take it directly off the left trochanter. And so by definition, you're taking the entire tendon off. Uh, so this will leave them weaker in flexion, which can persist for up to two to three months. Um, I personally don't, I only do this in patients post hip replacement. Um, I don't, wouldn't normally do it in, in a patient who's just having a hip preserving surgery or arthroscopy. It's a little bit fiddly, but quite doable uh, endoscopically. Uh, and essentially you identify the left trochanter and then work your way down and then release it off that. But it's a really good way of doing it in patients with a hip replacement where you don't want or can't get through through the central compartment itself. But there are complications to all of these techniques uh, and certainly the patients can get uh, hip flexion. Well, they will all get some degree of hip flexion weakness initially. Although for most patients, they're still quite happy because the pain is gone um, and they're just weak. And then that will recover as the tendon re well, regrows and heals essentially, but in a lengthened, lengthened uh, position. If you go through that central compartment and are too aggressive with your anterior capsular release, you can increase their hip instability, which will make things much more uh, problematic for the patient. Uh, in these hypermobile patients, the hip flexors are really important stabilizer of the joint, and I'll come to that in a second. They are a difficult group to manage, um, and so they can have persistent pain. And again, if you do a very large capsular release, particularly from the central compartment, there is a risk of fluid extravasation, um, particularly if you're pumping the fluid in under high pressure. So you need to be very aware of that. And I think in, in some ways, this is one of the most important slides. Um, and that is beware of female patients who classically are dancers or gymnasts um, or some martial arts, uh, the people with hypermobility or joint laxity, because essentially the psoas tendon is a really important stabilizer of the joint. And often these joints are unstable. They often have some degree of dysplasia from quite severe to relatively mild. It's, it's often sore secondary to a hip joint. So if you just treat the psoas tendon in isolation, Eventually, it will come back again, even with rehab injections, if you haven't addressed the underlying issue, which is usually the hip joint. So my big advice is manage the hip pain and then deal with the tendon as a secondary issue. Uh, and I think for most of us, we've become much more conservative around the so tendon over time, 
And so certainly in my practice, I only release it as a last resort. And if I look through my logbook, we do far less SOAS releases now than we used to. So BICAS is very keen that we, we show some evidence in what we're doing. And so these are just three sample papers from both the Journal of Hip Preservation Surgery and then Arthroscopy. And essentially, uh, the first paper was by Ben Dome. Um, and he essentially did a big survey of high volume arthroscopists recently. And essentially what it showed was that as a group, they were doing less SOAS releases. So I think people in general are becoming much more mindful of the true role of the SOAS tendon and how important it is with hip stability. Um, the, the other two papers are very much contradictory. So the second one, which is in the top right of the, of the screen, was by Dean Matsuda. And he essentially showed that um, the outcomes in patients with SOAS releases was poorer than in those without SOAS releases. Now, the caveat to that was this wasn't a double-blind study, uh, so they were self-selecting patients, and you could argue that those with SOAS releases were more complex patients who may well have had hypermobility. But it's, it's interesting to show that the outcomes weren't as good. And then to contradict that, Ben Dome's group did another paper, uh, again published in Arthroscopy, which essentially showed that they did just as well as those without SOAS releases. So the evidence is, is a bit contradictory. So... In summary, and it'd be useful to get everybody, all the speakers' opinion on this, in my experience, the iliopsoas pathology is usually secondary to an underlying hip issue, uh, be it labral tears, cam deformities, pincers, whatever. Um, and the big advice is treat the underlying condition first uh, and then rehab the patient and only go after the psoas then if you have to. So if you can manage it non-surgically, with rehabilitation, so core strengthening and hip girdle strengthening. If they do a lot of yoga, aim for core rather than flexibility. And injections can be really useful to help with that, either into the joint itself or up the psoas sheath using ultrasound. Only do surgical release as a last resort and be very conscious of where you do that resort. Um, and I would tend to do it through the peripheral compartment because there's less long-term functional outcome and you're not going to make them more unstable within an already potentially unstable joint. And that's just a, a discussion uh, slide that we can get to later on. So thank you very much, Vikas and Tony. Thank you, Max. That's absolutely brilliant. And I think you've raised some very interesting points there that will uh, provide us with some debate a bit later on. Um, I think um, if I can just appeal to everybody who's uh, listening in today and watching this, if you can send your questions through the Q&A uh, section and then we can answer those for you. Um, and I think let's move on to the next speaker um, whilst you're all firing off the questions and we can start to answer them. And we've got a Q&A session at the end of the session so we can um, go into more detail on those. But I think there are some controversial topics there that, Max has covered, and we can come back to those a bit later. So thank you for that, Max. Um, so I think we can move on now to Professor Andy Langdown from Portsmouth and Dubai. And, um, and so we've heard about something that's going on at the front of the hip with the psoas tendon. We're now going to hear about something going on on the side of the hip with the abductors and, and uh, the gluteal tendons and problems related to those. So Andy, can you share your wisdom? wisdom with us on those topics please uh yeah i will do tony thank you very much um let me try and get this all sorted okay is that all right can everyone see what i've got there yep that's great thank you andy perfect so my remit uh is to talk about greater trochanteric and teric pain syndrome and gluteal cuff tears thanks again tony thanks to vikas for inviting me this has been a bit of a bugbear of mine for quite some time and i know max has heard me talk on this subject before so i apologize if i'm boring you max um bottom line is this is how you should be looking at this this is probably the most important slide that, that i'm going to show if you think that somebody can present with primary trochanteric bursitis please listen up because genuinely it doesn't exist my disclosures, pure and simple, but even in Portsmouth on the south coast of England, the weather is not this nice at the moment. Okay, so the clinical presentation of patients who have um, 
greater trochanteric pain syndrome, lateral hip syndrome, whatever you want to um, call it, is they are almost universally female, although there is a group that I'll talk about in a little bit um, who have had a total hip replacement through a hard inch approach. They are over the age of 40, usually a little bit uh, overweight. They present with lateral hip pain, which is pretty much focused in the peritrochanteric region. Typical symptoms include that they can't lie on the infected side. Um, they get pain, particularly walking up a slope or upstairs, and that's largely because of the anterior fibres of glute medius which are involved. Clinical examination will show that they have point tenderness. There is pain on resisted abduction if you lie them on their side and ask them to abduct their hip. Frequently, there will be tightness of the iliotibial band, and Ober's test is a very good one for this. Slightly flex the hip underneath uh, and then put the um, leg that you're examining, flex the knee a little bit, have the hip in extension, and then adduct the hip towards the couch, uh, and they will complain of pain. Frequently, they're trend Ellenberg positive, and I would um, encourage you all to test it, not only for the sort of instant nature of the trend Ellenberg test, but also asking them to fatigue a little bit as well. So get them to stand for 30 seconds or so, and you'll see them wobble. There is a very high chance of them suffering with coexistent low back pain, and they frequently had a previous injection into the bursa, which may have been administered by any clinical practitioner. In terms of investigations, what I do is I get a plain radiograph. You will frequently see these, which are enthesophytes. Now, my understanding of these is that where you have a traction injury um, to a tendon, in effect, what you're doing is you're getting elevation of the periosteum around here. What does the periosteum do when it's elevated? It forms bone. So these are a very good hallmark for um, gluteal tendinopathy. More often than not, um, the joint itself is normal, but it can be associated with an, uh, with an arthritic joint as well. I now get an MR scan in everyone that I suspect of having this, largely because if you see it on an MR scan, then that is diagnostic. Um, however, it is a static examination, where so an ultrasound which is a bit more dynamic and allows uh, an injection of steroid and local anaesthetic into the joint is much more useful. Now, my apologies in advance for this slide. I was introduced to the concept of what's called hip hanging by Jess, who was one of the physios who used to work in my clinic, and she's been um, uh, taken over by Victoria now. What they said to me was that hip hanging is that classic pose uh, that women have as they stand on one leg predominantly with the hip adducted. I googled hip hanging pictures and this was the first one that came up. So the problem is that you have a tendon which is subjected to a compressive load as a result of standing in a typically adducted stance, as you can see here. 95% plus of the patients that I see with this problem are women. The tendon in women has a smaller insertional area and they tend to have a slightly more varus femoral neck, so a, therefore a lower neck shaft angle. If you then combine that with this behavioral concept of hip hanging, what happens is you have increased compression of the abductor tendon in adduction. The iliotibial band then becomes tightened and the gluteal tension itself is reduced. So in other words, the female anatomy with a smaller tendon insertion area, a slightly more adducted or varus femoral neck and behavioural characteristics, and I include with that the gait pattern as well, the typical catwalk gait, leads to gluteal tendon atrophy, therefore the tendon becomes weak. There is therefore subsequent overload of a tendon that has a smaller cross-sectional area of collagen. Undersurface tears develop, and then you have progressive detachment from the peritrochanteric region. Secondary to this, you frequently see patients who have overload of the iliotibial uh, band. That becomes hypertrophic, incredibly tight, and frequently you'll see them with an external snapping hip. Subsequent to that, they get bursal change, and this is what prov provides a lot of the lateral hip pain. So yes, trochanteric bursa exists, but it is a secondary or even tertiary problem rather than a primary one.
In my hands, the management is firstly to establish the diagnosis. What we want to do is rule out any intra-articular pathology. We may get some further imaging. Frequently, that's an MR and an ultrasound-guided injection, as I say, although a normal scan does not exclude the diagnosis because undersurface tears, when you're early in the disease process, are extremely difficult to see. So there is poor reliability of these imaging um, studies. A diagnostic injection is probably the most useful um, study that we have. I will only consider surgery if there is return of symptoms after a positive injection and they failed conservative management. There are some rare exceptions to that when you really do see a massive tear on the scan with significant gluteal atrophy. In terms of literature, this is pretty much it, I'm afraid. There isn't a lot. Um, this is from John O'Donnell's group in Australia, um, which looks at uh, treatment of gluteal tendinopathy, which suggests that there is some evidence for injection using PRP in early tendinopathy. Um, and then in um, later stages, grade three, grade four, when you have significant tears, uh, there is some evidence to suggest surgery, but no randomized prospective studies as of yet. My algorithm is pretty much like this. They have persistent pain, so you get an x-ray. They may have osteoarthritis. And what I've put down here is up for um, discussion later, should people wish to do it. If they have significant osteoarthritis and an MRI, which has shown significant gluteal cuff dysfunction or a tear, then you probably should deal with both at the same time. And in my book, more on this in a bit. This is the only indication for a hard hardinge approach when you're doing a hip replacement. Frequently, however, the joint is normal, so you're then getting subsequent uh, MR scan to confirm the diagnosis of extra articular pathology, confirmed with a diagnostic injection, managed with the usual, which in these patients frequently is weight loss and hip-specific physiotherapy. If they settle, don't worry about them, you can leave them alone. If not, then there is the option of surgery. So our surgical options, um, you do have the option of peritrochanteric arthroscopy. I've done this and I know Ernest has probably done a lot more than I have. I find it incredibly difficult. Um, I think it is a tough area to get an accurate A diagnosis and B reconstruction of the muscle. It is a very steep learning curve. And these patients are far fewer than the ones that I see in my practice with hip impingement. So the question is whether or not a repair through the arthroscopic technique is actually feasible. It's certainly time consuming, technically difficult. And the question is whether or not the repair actually heals, largely because the, 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 the start of the actual problem itself is underneath the gluteus medius tendon, which is not easily accessible to your view. However, it is a bit less invasive and therefore you are pre preserving the fascia lata over the peritrochanteric region. In terms of an open approach, I do this in a lateral decubitus um, approach, uh, a lateral approach, so he's centered over the greater trochanter. I excise the bursa and I frequently have to release the iliotibial band. You can do an OBAS test intraoperatively. And if you put your assistant's finger underneath it, they usually curse and swear because it is seriously tight. Sometimes if the proximal tissues remain tight, you can release there as well. And you effectively do a Z lengthening. We explore the gluteus tendon. If it's just an undersurface tear, and I'll show you one of these in a minute, uh, then you can actually do a trans tendinous repair and using suture anchors. If the tendon is detached or if it's significant tendinopathy, then you can detach it, excise the enthesophytes and restore the musculotendinous junction. And then I, I put um, multiple anchors in to reconstruct it. It is certainly easier for massive tears, but it is more invasive. So the types of tear, um, similar to those in the shoulder, really, um, it's an undersurface tear, which can be focal or complete. An undersurface tear with elongation, attenuation of the musculotendinous junction and very poor collagen. Then the gluteus medius tendon tends to elongate and split and then it can finally detach. The collagen quality is universally poor in stages three and four. So this is a question, should we routinely augment it? And if so, what should we augment it with? Okay, so operative findings. Here is someone whose cuff looked intact when you looked at it macroscopically. Um, she certainly had some inflammatory change on ultrasound and MR. 
Actually, when I made a couple of little splits in line with the muscle fibers here, you could put this um, McDonald directly underneath and you could go right underneath the cuff. And frequently you'll see buckling of the peritendinous tissue here. So this is a nice, straightforward couple of anchors, a couple of sutures to close it. Jobs are good. This is a 45 year old woman who granted was significantly overweight. Um, she had uh, huge enthesophytes and a massive cuff tear on MR scan. Now, this is when we've gone through the fascia. She has a bare trochanter. Her anterior gluteus medius fibers are here. The lateral or proximal gluteus medius fibers are here. And you can see there's a split within the fibers there. So this was a five anchor reconstruction, which I use what I call a chain type suture. And actually at six months post-op after she'd done her rehab, she was delighted and she was completely symptom free. So it's not something that you should abandon as a bad operation. Um, I use a single night stay. Patients are mobilized fully weight bearing, but they're on crutches for six weeks because I don't want them to relearn that limp. And I don't encourage active abduction or really any physiotherapy for the first six weeks. I won't let them off their crutches until they're trend and they're both negative. Um, I looked at um, the first 45 patients that I did. They're all open surgery. The mean UCLA score pre-op was three, which effectively means that they're struggling to get to the shops. Post-op, um, nearly seven, which means that they're independent of living, able to play bowls, swim, and, for example, ride a bike. Non-arthritic uh, non hip score was also significant improvement. There was one infection which resolved with antibiotics. So um, the hardinge approach, number one, the gluteal cuff is the most important hip stabilizer in the stance. If you use a hardinge approach, that you're detaching it. There is a failure of reconstruction rate and secondary repair is difficult because you get scar tissue and a retracted gluteal tension. And you also have an implant in situ. So repairing it after a hip replacement is a tough one. Gluteal tendinopathy and hip arthritis can coexist and frequently do. You will see enthesophytes. They will have a significant tendinopathy gait. They may have lateral hip pain. So my um, concept is that the only indication for a hardinge approach in a hip replacement is when you're about to reconstruct the abductors at the same time. And again, those questions arise. What should you use and should you augment it? So my summary is that gluteal tendinopathy is a very common cause of lateral hip pain, probably the commonest. The end stage is a detachment. Diagnosis can be tricky, and you can use all of these as adjuncts to make, uh, to make your diagnosis. Um, Non-operative management certainly consists of physio, analgesia, weight loss. Uh, and then the question is whether or not we should use open or arthroscopic surgery. The final points really are bursitis doesn't exist on its own. And I personally think that the hardinge approach for a hip replacement should be binned. I'm deliberately being controversial because I want to provoke some argument here. But if there is a cuff tear, then you should use the torn muscle and you should reconstruct it at closure. I have had to reconstruct the gluteal cuff on someone who had a posterior approach used when they had a significant cuff tear. And she was left with a flail hip for two years. So if you do see a significant cuff tear, please use that gap. Tony, that's me done. Uh, thank you, Andy. And uh, thank you for those sort of controversial topics. One of the things we didn't quite touch on was perhaps the coxa saltans externa and how we deal with that, but maybe we can come back to that in the discussion. And uh, apologies to everybody about the um, uh, hip hanging x-ray, uh, sorry, photograph, which... Um, hopefully didn't offend anybody. Um, but um, I think we can move on now to Professor Ernest Shoulders from London, uh, who's going to talk to us, or London and Leeds, should I say, Ernest? And he's going to talk to us about inguinal problems. So, um, Ernest, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tony and, and Vikas, for uh, inviting me to speak at uh, this webinar and, and let me uh, give me the opportunity to share my um, uh, experience with uh, in, in in this particular area. Uh, next slide. So, um, growing pain in athletes is is quite common. In it uh, we see it commonly in, in sports that involve a lot of kicking, twisting movements, changing direction. Uh, in an elite athletes, it accounts for about six percent of all the sports related injuries. And historically, 
um, uh, about 58% of the football players uh, reported to have a history of groin pain. Next slide. So um, for the purpose of tonight, I will, I'll, I will uh, present a case study of a professional football player complaining about right-sided groin pain in the inguinal pubic area and the adductor area. Uh, he also complains about intermittent testicular pain. There is a three-month history of uh, gradual onset of pain. Kicking and sprinting is painful. There's also pain coughing and sneezing, predominantly after games and training, and currently is not able to play anymore. Next slide. Uh, so I was a part of the DOA agreement, and that, that actually helps us for this particular patient. The DOA agreement um, uh, proposed to subdivide um, groin pain in different anatomical areas. So the adductor area, iliopsoas area, inguinal area, pubic area, and, and hip area. Next slide, please. So for this particular patient, we start with the inguinal area. The inguinal canal is the uh, is, is canal that contains the spermatic cord, has a, a deep inguinal ring uh, and uh, a superficial inguinal ring, which is an opening in the fascia external oblique. Next slide, please. So what we commonly see in uh, athletes with inguinal pain is, a, is actually a, a tear in the fascia external oblique, so splitting of those fibers. So this causes an enlargement of the uh, external inguinal ring, and, and that can easily be examined uh, through scrotal invagination. So here, we, we don't really have uh, any imaging uh, modality to support us. Next slide. So this is how it looks uh, during surgery. So you can see how, the, how there's a gap between uh, uh, the two ends of the um, uh, fascia external oblique. So there's, a, there's really a splitting of those uh, fibers. Next slide, please. So, um, what, what we can see during a clinical examination when we ask uh, a patient to do resist abduction with hips and extension is that uh, with this maneuver, it uh, uh, reproduces the pain in the inguinal area. When we are dealing with adductor related pain, usually they will uh, be able to pinpoint uh, pain over the adductor tendon. And, and when we do the same maneuver with the hips and flexion, uh, usually the pain is less or disappears. Next slide. So when we look at the back of the groin canal, so we see that the posterior wall consists of the fascia transversalis and the phallus inguinalis. The deep inguinal ring is an opening in the uh, fascia transversalis. Next slide. So the area of interest is the um, uh, Hesselbach triangle. It's the uh, angle between the triangle between the uh, epigastric vessels at the top, the lateral rectus, uh, and the inguinal ligament. Next slide. So it's it's a complex area and you can see how the close relationship is with rectus abdominis, with um, pyramidalis muscle and adductor longus. Next slide. Next slide. And what we typically see in uh, athletes in inguinal pain is a bulging of the posterior wall. So that's bulging of the uh, lateral aspect of the floor of the inguinal canal. Next slide, please. So we can uh, typically uh, um, repair this with, with application of the posterior wall, so a minimal repair technique. Uh, some people like to use mesh to do this, either laparoscopic or open, uh, but I'm, I'm not really much in favor to use mesh uh, in, in athletes. Next slide, please. So it's also important that we examine other structures of the inguinal canal, so the nerves. So there's the lingual nerve, iliohepigastric nerve and the genital branch of the genital femoral nerve. Next slide. So the linguinal nerve and iliohepigastric nerve, they run parallel with each other uh, between the uh, transversalis muscle and internal oblique. Once they pierce the internal oblique, they become uh, mainly sensory nerves. The iliohepigastric nerve pierces uh, the external oblique more immediately and innervates the area in the suprapubic area. Whilst the um, uh, Ilinguinal nerve often exits through the external oblique, uh, to the uh, external inguinal ring, and uh, can uh, interface here on the inside of the thigh. And, and that often that can cause um, more, more vague, ill defined uh, adductor pain. Next slide. The third nerve is the genital branch of the genital femoral nerve. It uh, 
enters the inguinal canal through the deep inguinal ring and then runs deep to the spermatic cord. Uh, it has two functions. There is a motoric function, which is the cremaster innervation, uh, but also it, it um, uh, has a sensory function. And, and often we see that with irritation of this nerve, uh, patients complain about testicular pain. And in athletes, we see about 20% of the athletes that complain about testicular pain, which might be very occasional or intermittent. So, so that's uh, one of the uh, pain symptoms that we have in our case. Next slide. So with revision surgery, often we see that there, is, there are adhesions around the inguinal nerve, as you can see here, which then require a neurolysis. Next slide. And often we see with revision surgery also uh, neuronomas, which can be quite large, as you can see. Next slide, please. So the imaging workup that we do with inguinal pain. Next slide. We have the cho we have we have a number of choices. Uh, I I don't feel that dynamic MR is that uh, is that reliable. I, I tend to use uh, ultrasound scan because you can examine patient in different positions. You can. Um, uh, uh, look for uh, posterior wall bulging, direct, indirect hernias. Also look at the iliosaurus at the same time. Next slide. And more importantly, you can also do um, selective ilingual nerve blocks. And we usually routinely examine uh, the patients before and after block and see if their symptoms uh, disappear. Next slide, please. So the um, anatomy is quite complex. Uh, we... We published the paper a few years ago. You can see the QR code. So if you want to take a picture, you can uh, download that paper about the anatomy in that area. Next slide, please. So we're now going to examine the second area uh, of pain, which is the adductor area. We, we introduced uh, a concept a few years ago of, of the plaque, which is the uh, adductor longus, uh, pyramidalis, and anterior pubic ligament complex. Next slide, please. Uh, this this concept has helped us uh, a lot in, um, in in our imaging interpretation of MR, but, but also it helps us with a better understanding of what what we, what we see with uh, associated injuries with, with uh, adductor avulsions. So so routinely, in addition to the adductor avulsion, we will also look at uh, the continuity of the longus and pyramidalis, or, or or it might be torn. And we also will look for partial pectineus avulsions. Next slide, please. So, so this is a, a lateral view. So you can see uh, the MR picture on, on the right side. You can see beautifully the fibrocardus with the ductal longus, uh, pubis, um, pyramidalis, and rectus abdominis. In, in high-level high athletes, often we don't see fat planes, and, and, uh, and, and probably that has led a bit to the confusion in the past. Uh, and I mean, you can see on in, in, on on, this, on the MR here that, the, that you can't really distinguish pyramidalis from the rectus abdominis. Next slide, please. So this is a Croatian athlete which who has more fat, and here you can actually see on the left side that uh, fat plane between pyramidalis and rectus abdominis. And when we uh, go from the left to the right, we start from medial medial cut to laterally. We see that the pyramidalis gradually. And decreases in size. Next slide, please. So when we examined about 148 uh, plaque injuries, we found that isolated adductor avulsions are less common, about 34%. 40% of the avulsions adductors were still in connection with the pyramidalis muscle. 36% had an anterior pubic ligament disruption. 33% partial uh, pectineus avulsion. And you see that rectus abdominis injury is quite uncommon with adductor avulsions. Next slide, please. So um, you can again scan the QR code if you like. Uh, this is uh, the study that we did looking at a different type of plaques. We, so we identified um, six types of plaques. Next uh, slide, please. And uh, we also see that, that different sports have different injury patterns. So we see that in rugby, for instance, partial uh, pectineal avulsions are more common even more common in martial arts and uh, water ski. Next slide, please. So how do we decide on treatment? We look at the type of sport. Some sports uh, require more explosive adductor work. Uh, the playing position in football is important uh, because, for instance, midfielders have a short passing game. Defenders and goalies kick long balls, and defenders also have to sprint a lot. The level of the athlete is important. Uh, we look at uh, 
the injury if it was high or low energy type of plaque is important and, and we assess if there has been a previous conservative management which has failed. Next slide, please. So we, we, we tend to use vibes, and this is important in younger athletes because often uh, they still has open uh, offices and that will somehow influence uh, the, the, the treatment and we might lean more towards conservative uh, management with uh, uh, open uh, growth plates. Next slide, please. So this is an example of a type 2. So we can see um, that uh, in addition to the adductor avulsion uh, separated from the pyramidons, there is also a partial avulsion of the Pictenase. On the right side, we see the MR image, uh, which uh, uh, which very typically shows this uh, injury. Next slide, please. So this is how it looks surgically. This is a, a right groin. So you can see the uh, adductor avulsion and partial Pictenase avulsion, and this is uh, reconstructed with uh, some suture anchors. Next slide, please. So this is another example. Uh, here we see that there's an adductor avulsion, but the uh, pyramidalis uh, is still in connection with the fiber cartilage and the adductor longus. And uh, the drawing on the right side uh, shows this, uh, as this schematically. Next slide, please. So the idea of a plaque repair is to restore the normal anatomy. Next slide, please. Usually in professional athletes, we uh, have them back in full training around nine weeks and return to play uh, on around uh, 11 weeks. Next slide, please. So we use uh, ultrasound also quite commonly uh, for uh, adductor injuries. We, we use it for uh, techniques like um, high volume stripping uh, for PRP and uh, top left corner. Uh, we use it also quite commonly for pubic left injections for a chronic adductor pain. Next slide, please. So uh, it's it's important that we that we understand the presentation of adductor pain usually. Uh, primary adductor pain, uh, adductor-related pain, uh, patients are um, easy uh, can, can easily pinpoint uh, where the pain is. When the pain is, when the pain in the adductor is more vague, we need to think about other conditions such as hip pubic overload, iliopsoas, inguinal disruptions, uh, and even sac -like joint pain or nerve type uh, injuries. Next slide, please. So to finish, I will uh, address the pubic-related component in in our case report. Next slide. So um, we do uh, MRs uh, of this area. So this is an example of an axial oblique cut. Uh, you can see the uh, increased signal in the pubic area where the uh, yellow arrow indicates. This is typical for um, pubic overload. It's important that you check that you check vitamin D. I mean, 41 is uh, quite low. So in, in professional athletes, we usually we aim at values of, of around 100. Next slide, please. We use um, uh, localized dexasen quite commonly, so we can look at the um, um, uh, bone density in the pubic area. And, and uh, uh, in, with pubic pain, it's quite commonly quite commonly we see that there is a reduced bone density in that area. And in, the, in those cases, often we use bifosphonates uh, to deal with this particular problem. Next slide, please. So um, my take-home messages are that the um, answer to understanding groin pain lies in the anatomy. The DOA consensus and uh, the splitting up in different uh, uh, anatomical areas of groin pain helps to uh, start with complex groin pain. Uh, we, we have to understand that, that we might have to use different uh, imaging modalities in, in different areas. So for the groin ultrasound, adductors, MR. So it's important that we, that we use the, the, the appropriate one. Not all inguinal related pain is related to the posterior wall. So think about uh, the facial external oblique, think about the nerves as well. And when we see that, uh, when we see athletes with testicular pain associated with groin pain, often the cause of pain is nerve related. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah. Thank you for your attention. That's great. Thank you, Ernest. And uh, thank you for your immense experience with that. Um, as you say, I mean, I think one of the big issues um, is that if you do a kind of a generalized pelvic or hip MRI, you're not really picking up on some of these pathologies, are you? You need dedicate, dedicated sequences to, to pick up these things. Um, 
And so I, I think just beware of uh, a reported normal MRI in these cases, because I think you just need to dig a bit deeper, don't you? Uh, but thank you for that. So I think we're rapidly running out of time, but um, I think if uh, the participants don't mind hanging on for a bit longer, we can cover some questions and hopefully we can cover some of these controversial topics we talked about before. Um, I think if I can go back to Max to start with and so, Max, in terms of psoas pathology, I mean, how much of this is actually due to instability? Particularly if we're taking the female patients you were talking about, you know, we, we can accept that it's a muscle imbalance. The, you know, the, the pelvis is stabilized by the combination of hip flexors, uh, the abductors. And, you know, if you've got gluteal weakness and you're getting this hip flexor overload, then should you actually ever do a psoas release? I know you said you do it as a last resort, but should you actually ever do one? Uh, sorry, Tony, I missed the very beginning of that, but I caught the end of it. Um, I think, well, certainly I, and I'm sure it would be interesting to see what you do and what Andy and Ernest do, but we're certainly doing far less of them. Uh, so now we're much more focusing on really good quality rehab, and obviously that can change dramatically from therapist to therapist. Certainly at the NHS at the moment, you know, patients are getting telephone physiotherapy, which, which obviously is completely different to really experienced sports therapists. So, so I think strengthening can make a huge difference. Things like the ultrasound injections, either using steroids, or I know some people are using blood products like PRP uh, or hyaluronic acid derivatives, they can be really useful. But I think even with all of that, uh, sometimes there is still a need to do a release. I mean, the, the case I showed was quite unusual in that it was a young male kind of footballer. It was very much a mechanical issue rather than just a painful psoas that isn't, doesn't have this enormous clunk that you hear from the other side. Of the room. So in his case, it was, it was a bit of a no-brainer. It was quite a straightforward, and, and he did very well from that. I think the really difficult ones are the hypermobile young females. Um, and certainly of the ones that I have released, a certain proportion will remain sore afterwards or will redevelop their pain two or three months down the line. So I think in those cases, I suspect it, it's not useful and not successful. Um, but it can be difficult to manage these patients when you've done everything else you can and they're still in loads of pain from their souls. And there was a question in the uh, Q&A session about the, you know, what, what do you feel the role of version abnormalities of the femur uh, is in the uh, pathophysiology of uh, psoas uh, problems? Yeah, I, I tried to answer that, but I had to log in and I had to log out and then come back in again. So it disappeared when I came back. Um, I, I, I mean, as a guess, I, I presume that if they've got a very retroverted method to counter, it's probably pushing, it's, it's obviously a longer distance for the tendon to go. It may be having the, the tendon under more um, strain, it maybe it's pulling it tighter over the front of the acetabulum. But it may also be in association with other proximal femoral deformities, so that the femoral head retroversion might be quite abnormal, or the acetabular orientation may be abnormal. So I think in that case, you'd want to look at the whole thing. Sorry, did I zoom out there? No, that's okay, Max. I think we got that. Thank you very much. And I think, Vikas, you, you've got your hand up. Yeah, just, just a question to all of you, actually, on the panel. Sorry, did you lose me? No, no, we, we, we got you, Max, on that. Just a question to everybody on the panel. So if you've got a classical uh, case of iliopsoas impingement in a young female where, you, where you've got a labral tear at the three o'clock position and you've got iliopsoas snapping, how do you tackle that? So you do your labral repair or not, and do, then are you actually going to do a partial release of the iliopsoas or not for this patient? That's a really good question, Vikas. So let's go through the panel. We'll start with Ernest. Ernest, how would you tackle that? Well, um, I, 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 I routinely do um, uh, 3D CT scans and clinical graphic analysis. And, and often we see that, um, that those patients have some anterior hip dysplasia. Um, so, uh, which means that, and, 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 I, and, and the pattern that I usually, that I, that I tend to see is that, um, so they, they, for a the moment they have, they have a tear uh, it creates some instability, and the you know saws certainly have to uh, start to overwork. Um, so in, in in those cases, uh, the, the the first thing that I want to do is is to to do um, a label repair. I don't I I am not a saws cutter, so 
I leave the I leave the stars at this, and we 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 do a strengthening program where we focus on on hip flex strengthening at 90 degrees and above. So you address the iliopsoas. Sometimes um, when uh, sometimes the, the pain doesn't settle, so we then to do we then tend to do uh, an ultrasound oh. scan, uh, usually about two months post op. So we can look at iliopsoas, see if there's some fluid around it, and then we might uh, do. Um, uh, an injection of the ESOs with some steroids um, to try to kickstart that uh, process of of ileosoas. So, but but I would I would never uh, I would never do um, uh, um, uh, soas tenotomy in, in somebody with anterior hip dysplasia because they, I think you you enter a vicious circle where you where you're going to struggle to get out if you, if you do that. No, I totally agree, Ernest. I mean, I think that's the last thing you want to do. Psoas is almost like the last stabilizer of the hip, it's stopping that femoral head from subluxing forwards. Yeah. You divide that, then you're going to make them so unstable, aren't you? Absolutely. Um, Andy, what's your view on this? Yeah, I agree. I think this is where a therapeutic strict diagnostic injection really comes home. I think the commonest reason for, um, in, in my practice, releasing psoas is if they've had persistent anterior hip pain post-hip arthroscopy, or dare I say it, post-hip replacement, when you look at the components and you think, well, actually, the components look good. I don't want to change that because a revision procedure is a big thing. And they've had a positive response to an injection. I'm with Ernest. I think psoas is an important stabiliser. You touch it at your peril. Um, so I do it very, very rarely. But having said that, it's a relatively straightforward thing to do, provided you've um, identified the right patient to do it in. I think frequently what's what's not really described well is that if you've got significant psoas pathology, actually there's a bit of inflammatory change in and around the capsule on the undersurface of the psoas tendon anyway. And you can see that the psoas tendon, as you release the capsule there, is very angry. And if that's the case, it's a very straightforward thing to do a psoas release. And as um, Max pointed out, that's a safe area to do it in because you're not releasing the entire tendon. You're, you're just getting it to lengthen and the muscle fibres will, will just adjust and give it a bit of laxity. Yeah, that was a really good paper looking at the cross-sectional um, sort of area of the myotendinous unit at yeah. the different levels, and you know, and the higher up you go, the you know, the more muscle you preserve, and you know, less tendon you take. So it's um, yeah. But I, I think even for those cases, Andy, I still wouldn't do a release because because I think it's a, a secondary phenomenon, and the inflammation is because it's being overworked. And I think you know, to Ernest's point, I think we just need to improve the. The rehab of those patients you can do the labor repair do the synovectomy but leave the tendon alone would be my my view I totally agree it's a it's a secondary um yeah. diagnosis and it's it's one of those things that you only treat in recalcitrant cases yeah but i think the message for all the viewers then is preserve the source and uh don't touch it unless absolutely necessary yeah, save the psoas. That's a new campaign we've got here tonight. Cool. Because save the psoas. Fantastic. Okay. Excellent. So if we can um, move on to the uh, the side of the hip, then. So we've we've had a um, great talk on uh, problems with the abductor tendons, and and Andy, we we talked about. So we've spoken about coxa saltans interna, which was the snapping psoas tendon. So you've got the coxa saltans externa, which is the a tibial band snapping over. We didn't really, I don't think you really touched on that in, in your talk. We're talking more about the gluteal tendons. What, can you just give us a quick synopsis on how you would tackle the coxa saltans externa? Physiotherapy, 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 physiotherapy. I think there are, there are massive behavioral problems with um, particularly the young person who presents with a snapping hip. So I think first you touched on it briefly a minute ago, rotational problems with the hip. I mean, you can get a very good idea in clinic if passively they have a balanced range of rotation about neutral and 90 degrees of flexion, you know you're not dealing with a significant rotational problem. And I personally, I'm reluctant to do osteotomies unless you absolutely have to do them around the hip. Um, there are occasions when you have someone who is really crippled by a snapping iliotibial band. And those patients, I don't have a problem operating on them. But I think in those patients, you should do a Z lengthening. I do it through an open approach and I stay proximal to the trochanter. Because if you, if you don't, then you have 
um, weakened tissue which is attempting to heal with bone underneath it and they get dreadful lateral hip pain. And actually the results of that provided your selective are very, very good. But the vast majority of people I will treat non-operatively. We get the physios to work with them. Frequently, you can see them. They have rotational problems in stance and they've got a dominant iliotibial band, weak abductors. So if you get them to put their feet at five to one or 10 to two rather than five past 11 so that they're out towing rather than in towing, you can get rid of that snapping of the hip pretty much straight away. And then off to physio they go. That's great. Thanks, Andy. Max, do you have a view on that? Or was it something else you wanted to share with no, us? No, sorry, but I'm now on 5G, so it seems to be working all right. Uh, no, it was a completely different question, actually, to Ernest. Um, and it was more around um, sportsman's hernia stroke um, groin disruption. Um, Ernest, we, we often see patients, particularly in sport, with, with dual pathology of FAI hips, but also uh, a visible abdominal wall weakness on stress ultrasound. And it can be difficult to separate them out. I mean, obviously, from the hip side, we can inject the hip. Um, but I do see a number of patients who've had hernia repairs, which have made no difference because the underlying issue is the hip joint. So the question really is, do you have a, a useful injection or a test like that that you use to prove that the abdominal wall weakness is the source of the pain rather than coming from elsewhere? And, and actually add another question onto that, Ernest, before you, before you answer. <laughs> if you do have actually dual pathology, which one do you address first? Yeah, okay, fine. So, um, um, so, so we use selective healing while nerve blocks. And, um, and, and that's very useful because uh, so we, we, do, we test some pre and post uh, injection. Uh, if, if, we do the, if we do the blocks and it doesn't make any difference to their symptoms, yeah, then... then then the groin is not the problem, basically. Um, uh, I know, I know, because we're hip surgeons, we we we, we like to operate hips, basically. But um, but but I, but I have to say that that, that um, yeah, in especially in football, um, uh, hips are rarely operated on, and and um, and and obviously, obviously there's also the fact that that. Um, Following a groin repair, you can get you be you can be back playing in three to four weeks. Uh, following hip arthroscopy, yeah, it's it's going to be a little bit longer, basically. So, so so therefore, um, uh, in 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 football, often um, uh, injections are used quite commonly. So 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 a, a cocktail of uh, steroids, um, um, duralin, and, and and local anesthetic, basically. So. Um, but um, uh, so because of because of the timings uh, timings during the season basically. But but I I I I I use very often uh, injections as part of my workup, and um, so so and it, it 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 really helps to unmap the pain. And uh, but um, but the the selective. Uh, nerve blocks it really helped me a lot to uh, and and if I, if I do selective well if if my uh, radiologist does, does selective nerve block and it doesn't make any difference to the symptoms then then I will not operate on the um, uh, on the gro on the, on the on the, don't, don't do the repair but something that I wanted to uh, touch on about the iliosaurus as well is that iliosaurus we see that we see very commonly in in um, in sports as well, and iliosaurus tenosynovitis um, uh, can be can be a normal feature in 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 certain sports. So, if you look at sprinters like 100, 200 meter, 400 meter sprinters, often we see that there is iliosaurus tenosynovitis uh, on on imaging, but but it's not necessarily symptomatic. So 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 basically, I look at those three things. I look at Iliosoas, I look at hip, I look at the inguinal canal. That, that, these are the most common, and the adductors, these are the most common things to, to uh, really try to unmap the pain. I hope that answers your question. That's excellent. Thank you, Ernest. And I think we're just about running out of time now. So I think I'd, I'd like to thank all the panellists tonight. And um, I think we want some take-home messages from each of you. So if I can go through each one of you in turn, just for a very quick take-home message. So if we start with Max first, as you went first. Uh, preserve the, the sewers and rehab, <laughs> rehab, rehab. Excellent. Thanks, Max. And Andy, take-home messages from you. 
Uh, take a message. Number one, trochanteric bursitis doesn't exist as a primary um, condition. Think about the gluteal cuff and uh, try not to take it off when you're doing a hip replacement. Excellent. Thank you. And Ernest, take home messages from you, please. Uh, take home messages. If, if you want to solve groin pain in athletes, you need to understand the anatomy. And it takes a long time. It took me years and years and years to understand that I'm, I'm getting there. So, so it's, it's really important that you, uh, it, I mean, for growing pain, it's also important that, that, um, uh, that, that, that we have a bit of a new approach that we look at all the structures, not parts of, uh, parts of the growing canal. No, that's very wise words. So um, I'd like to thank our three professors for their very wise words tonight. And thank you all for tuning in. Um, and I'll hand it back to Vikas for his take-home message. Thank you, Vikas. My take-home message is uh, with uh, all the three take-home messages, save the source, learn your anatomy, and there is no trochanteric bursitis. Uh, there's something underlying going on. But more importantly, Tony, thank you very much for the moderation and to all the three speakers and everybody tuning in tonight, both from the UK and the Asia-Pacific region. Have a lovely Christmas and New Year, and we'll see you back in Jan. Thanks a ton, everybody. Bye, all. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.